All right, well, looks like we got most everybody. Uh, my name is Bruce Walkley. I'm a, a first year canola grower. Uh, and I did a bunch of research and somehow Karen thought that qualified me to be on a panel. So uh, I work on uh, Walkley Farms, which is 10 miles outside of Burbank, uh, farming for my grandparents. And then uh, I was interested in canola because I needed another low early water use crop to fit in the irrigation rotation because I don't quite have enough water to keep everything turned on at one time. I printed up a list of just various notes and everything, kind of a guide to what I did. I went to a few field days, sat down with Karen, sat down with Jeff, and and talked with other people here and there. And so I'll just kind of run through and feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, I just decided to try it out on a little 18 acre half circle, figured if the whole thing tanked, it wouldn't, it wouldn't sink me. Uh, we were following a 110 bushel DNS crop. We swathed and baled. The only reason I, I didn't burn is because the field was right next to the highway and right next to power pools and who knows who's going to be driving by and seeing what. So uh, ran the turbo till over it and then watered it up and got the first flush of wheat growing and then we dissed it, uh, watered it some more, got the second flush grow, growing and then uh, Hit it with Roundup and then applied the pre-plant fertilizer like I have in there, ADN and 20S and 15P and then watered again and planted. And the whole theory that I had kind of got from Jeff and the others was I wanted a kind of a stale seedbed approach and I wanted it nice and firm, not, not worked up too much. So that's I only dissed it once. Uh, and then to plant, we... We have uh, some sunflower double opener disc drills, and we turn those down pretty much as far as we could. And then uh, when Adam ended up putting on about 4.1 pounds an acre of seed, which ended up being a little light, but it's in the ballpark, so we got close enough. Uh, and then we plant behind a a chisel chopper so we get a pretty good nice smooth seed bed there was a little bit of wheat residue here and there just perfect as far as we were concerned took about a week to come up uh, 10 days crop was roughly an inch high and then kind of just sprayed select uh, for it was right at about four weeks after took care of the wheat and uh, we had roughly three quarters of an inch rain, so I never turned the circle back on. Uh, and our plants got roughly this size, depending on uh, which one. And in retrospect, given the uh, given the same set of conditions, which of course won't happen next year. I could have seeded a bit earlier, maybe the 1st of September, and still been okay. I don't think I would have gotten too much growth. Um, the first frost made the leaves, uh, should be an S there, uh, leaves wilt and turn brown. And it's a good thing that people had told me canola would look like crap over the winter, because it does. And I'm, I'm uh, hoping that this past... Uh, Last week it got up to 56 degrees on our place, and so I'm hoping things didn't start growing too much, and then now the cold will shut them off and cause problems that way. But that's strictly a wait and see proposition. So plans for the spring, uh, we'll take another soil test, uh, put on the remainder of the <clears throat> nitrogen, the the reasoning behind the amounts uh, 
again, comes mostly from talking to Jeff. He's figured out that a roughly a four to one nitrogen sulfur ratio usually works the best and about 180 pounds of N or so. And then we do have some more volunteer wheat out there, so we're gonna take care of that. I'm hoping to avoid using a broadleaf herbicide. We'll see if I can get up and growing and and uh, shade everything out, then I'll probably be okay. And then we'll put some boron and then a fungicide. Uh, we use on our wheat and all the circles in our place, we use a moisture monitoring service that goes down three feet and tells us where the water level's at and then evapotranspiration rates and all that, which is how we figure out if something needs water or not. Um, and then we'll see if we need aphids and then I'm going to try to uh, harvest it with my R72 and we'll probably uh, swath it and then go in later with the combine. I, I've been told both ways and it'll probably be a game time decision but uh, and then who knows what the yield would be giving the uh, first given that this is the first time I've done it. I chose, let's see, variety wise, I chose Amanda simply because I figured I'd start with non-GMO and if it worked, I'd stay with it. And then if it didn't, well, I'd switch. And then Amanda seems pretty common around, around here, so. Um, Sandy, let's see. Yeah, soil types uh, were sandy loams, loamy sands. Right now, our farm looks looks pretty bad because all the uh, those 40 and 50 mile an hour winds that came through, all the sand hills got up and moved and blew over the roads and the fields. And my dryland wheat looks rather pitiful, but uh, <clears throat> that's where we are and. Uh, Resources, this book, uh, which I know Karen has around, is, uh, is good because it has pictures. And then a lot of the nutrient stuff and fertilizer recommendations are different because it's the Midwest, but the growing processes are roughly the same. And then uh, there's this irrigated and dry land canola guide that uh, OSU put out that uh, seems to be pretty good as well so that's more or less what I did I can probably tell you more things that I've done wrong than can I can tell you what I've done right with uh, canola on my farm um, the first year we had took over the farm I decided to go out there and fly it on um, ahead of harvest time mixed it with the corn Mix him some fertilizer. The ag pilot was going to said he could, could it double fly it. Ended up coming back to chemical rotations. Check them out because at the last moment, right before that, while the airplane was loaded, I realized I had to put a power flex on three months prior and had to go to a different field. And we ended up flying on to stubble that had actually been cut. Um, ag pilot really didn't have his gates figured out very well, and we left the field incredibly striped. Um, the, uh, we had some places that probably seeded as close to as 20 pounds per acre, and then other spots were seeded all the way down to a, about a pound per, pound per acre. Um, we also had a lot of different seed problems as far as uh, the, you could tell every place a truck went, play every place a combine went, but you would have a big heavy stand. Other places there'd be no stand. And that was around a Brady variety. Um, we did spray it in the fall. It worked very, very well as far as taking out the volunteer. Unfortunately, being around a Bredy, it did not have a lot of winter hardiness, and coming out of that next winter time, it absolutely froze out. I, my other experiences with canola done, I've always, as far as when I go to prepare a seed bed, I've always had a firm and fine, and whether you burn, or bale, or whatever, I don't think residue is your friend most of the time. And uh, kick the other slide. And this, this is my neighbor up here in Wilbur, and they had baled the stubble off and then they 
took a match to it, and the spot you see right there in the middle, that's where the pivot sat. Um, and that's volunteer, then they came and sprayed it out. But I think that's a pretty good example of what over residue can do for you. Um, it's a beautiful looking Santa Canola. It was seeded probably the first part of September. Um, everything looks great about it except for where the pivot sat. And, um, and the year before, they had bailed all the residue off, and then they had used their Great Plains drill and seeded right into it. And it was a remarkable difference. On my farm the same year, I didn't have a chance to bale it. I went ahead and I chopped all the stubble, and then I have a set of uh, 9400 hoe drills, and to get through the stubble, I took every other opener off and seeded it at 20 inch row spacing. The uh, residue gave me a lot of fits, and we'll address some of the issues later that had with that farm. Uh, like I said, there's several different ways you can put canola on. I've seen it flowing on. I've seeded it with a 20 inch hoe drill, and I've also used some uh, 455 drills uh, at six inch spacing to seed it. Next slide, please. Um, I would say one of the th things I have seeded, have done wrong most time is not spend the time before I've seeded my canola. And um, I had a seed cup in here that was all worn out and I forgot it over the booth, it's over at the Spectrum booth if you want to look at it. But my drills had a lot of garbanzo beans and peas through them and all the plastic openers were all cupped out. So when you went to go seed them, it would just move all over the place. Each one was different, very inconsistent. I end up going through and putting new seed cups on my drills. But when you zero them out, there's also a bunch of different ways to zero them. Actually, refer to your owner's manual. It does a wonderful job of describing how to zero out your cups. But I found best, open them all the way up, slide them down to zero, and then go through and zero every one of them. I also spent the money for, uh, for slow speed drives. I know the Great Plains drills, they do an excellent job of, of being able to change your gear speeds. Um, on my 455s, you actually had to go out paid 800 or 900 bucks for seven gears or, or six gears, and I thought it was a real ripoff, but at the same token, it was money well, well spent. Um, and I guess I get back to this, because your seeding rate's pretty important, I feel, on canola. Um, when you're paying for, the, if you're doing a GMO canola, you could be at $9, $10 a pound. If you overshoot by two pounds, you be $20 an acre in cost. When you're dealing with a crop that's going to pay you back 15 to 20 cents, depending on the year, especially like a spring canola where you might only have 2,500 pounds, you can't be giving away those dollars. So spend the time ahead of time on your drill before you go out and seed it. A lot of gr drills will come with grass seed boxes if you have them, use them. I don't have them, not a luxury I have. Um, if you guys do have them, I think I'd probably go that route. As far as seed rate, seed spacing, it kind of depends whether I'm doing winter canola or, seed, or spring canola. Um, there's a gentleman over here walking around today. His name is uh, Phil Thomas. He's from the Canadian Canola Council up there in, in uh, Canada. He's probably written the whole canola growers manual. If you guys get a chance, want to drink a beer with him, have a whiskey, uh, I, would, uh, I would recommend it. He knows more about, he's forgot more about canola than any of us will ever know probably. But, you know, the winter canola, I've always shot around four pounds to the acre, five pounds. And I've always kept my row spacing fairly big from 16 to 24 inch spacing. Um, I guess the reason for that is on our winter canolas, we have lots of time for that plant to bloom and branch out. And I always said, I want an oak tree for a canola plant. I, mean, I want that thing to be a big stock and be big and branchy. But on the spring canola, you don't get that luxury of having four to six weeks of, of bloom period. You get 10 days. If you get two weeks, we're doing good. So I like to, to, to start blooming and hit hard because you, you don't know when mother nature is going to shut you down. As uh, far as the varieties I've had, uh, it kind of depends on the situation. On my farm, I have, I'm have i loaded with bed straw, china lettuce, you name it, I have it. Um, I have found probably I've tried conventional varieties. I just My farm is just dirty enough where I can't get much done there and I have bad weed problems. So I've gone to the GMOs, um, mostly Roundup Ready, works well. Finding a variety will survive the winter time has been my hardest problem. Um, I'm probably a little bit late up there in Wilbur Country sometimes seeding it, and I've had issues with it coming out of winter time. Uh, on the dry land situation, it's been a big has, has been a difference. Uh, fertility, I think one of the worst things I've done in my place is uh, I don't put enough on. I'm raising 3,000 pound dry land canola, 
but I can't seem to get to 2,000 pound or 2,500 pound on my irrigation. Um, don't ask me. Um, I do a better job on my dry land than I do my irrigation. Um, but I, I do feel that most of the time, if anything ho holds me back, because I haven't done a, a good enough job of fertilizing. Um, that's a picture I took of my place. That's a little seed pod weevil hanging out in the blooms. Um, as you can see, I, the things I did wrong, I didn't spray. Here's another picture of the same field I had last year. Um, this was a field that I seeded. I tore out half of it, thinking that the other half would probably, let's roll the dice and see what happens. If you have a mess, I'd probably say, if it looks like a mess coming out of spring, it's probably gonna be a mess at harvest time, and that's what this was. Um, it's full of China lettuce. Um, this was conventional under irrigation. It yielded right about 1,800 pounds. It, uh, and like I said, I direct seeded right into uh, triticale stubble. I, w I wouldn't do, do it again. I would do something different. Um, some of the other things I've done wrong with it, uh, I've had sclerotinia blow out of control. Um, I would water it. We got a big windstorm. We had extra water left over because we, the potatoes got shut down and everything else. So I said, well, potatoes are going to need water here in, in a week or so, so let's go for it. So I tried to load up the profile. Wrong thing to do. Um, within one week after that storm went through and everything got laid over, my field literally turned white and I lost a third of the crop. All the seeds were red at harvest time. Um, it was a really good looking field of spring canola. Um, and it still went just a little bit low, 2,500 20, pounds, like 2,400 and something. But I really do believe that I probably lost a third of the crop due to sclerotinia. So try to manage the water well. I think if I did again on spring canola, I would give it a good shot and stay away from it for a while before I came back. I just wouldn't keep spoon feeding it all the time. Um, just kind of creates a really good moist environment. Uh, that's that field of spring canola over at my farm. Um, that was two years ago. Um, it was an awesome looking field. Pretty proud of it, but it didn't yield, didn't yield that much. As far as harvesting goes, I've always struck cut it. I've never swathed it. Um, I've always gone ahead and put a spodum on or a pod seal or similar products. There's quite a few different products out there now. They range from price. Hit your chemical rep up, they can usually find something. Um, but it's about a push probably between flying a spodum on and uh, going out there and, and harvesting it or, or having someone swath it. By the time you pay for the spodum and the airplane job, it's about the same as a, a swather, I probably feel. I guess one of the things I've always felt with swathing um, winter canola, since it does bloom for four or six weeks, you can get a lot of variability in, within that plant. Um, you can have pods on the top that are fairly ripe or on the bottom and stuff that's not. So I always felt like I was leaving some yield on the table and not letting everything mature enough. So I've, I've never had any problem with... Uh, with going ahead and direct harvest. I, I will say probably one of the, the, the nice things about swathing is you do get to take it off earlier. With the direct harvest, a lot of times, when it looks like it's ready to cut, that plant will sit there and sucker and sucker and sucker. And what you and you think you should have been probably harvesting it two weeks ago, and it will just kind of stay green for a long time. So if, if your goal is to get it off quick, get, try to get it watered up, and to get your next crop back on it, swathing will probably have a big advantage. If you're not really concerned about timeline, um, and we, we're all concerned about time, but if, if, it's, if you have time to, to, to let it to ripen, I, I see no why, reason why a guy can't go ahead and, and direct cut it. Uh, it is slower. I mean, have patience. You just, in draper headers, they don't work. Um, they work kind of. I have two of them, and one of them has uh, the, the small augers, small seed augers on the top of it that will hold it down to the, to the belts. They do a better job. But I still, I think last year I went over and asked one of my friends who was done harvesting if I could borrow his auger header and I finished up with it because it did a much better job of, of uh, harvest. Go ahead. That's it. Um, I have probably done more things wrong on canola than I've done right. Um, especially when it comes to irrigation. Like I said, I'm just kind of figuring it out and rolling from there. But um, ask away if you guys have any questions. Um, yeah, Bill. I did it just one year. 
I mean, I kind of got, I feel like I kind of got burned a little bit on the, on the, on the one year stand. You know, like I said, the ag pilot flew it on and he got a couple stripes that were just, I mean, it was so thick, it was ridiculous. It was probably half the, half the crop got put on, the load got put on in two passes and then he just started pulling it back. Um, and, and that particular year was a pretty cool, that was like three years ago, maybe four. Um, it was a particular cold year that year and I had Drex, I had dry land canola just right across the next field over, um, seeded with HC drills about the same time. And it had a 100% survival rate through the, through the winter. Unfortunately, the, the stubble field I flew on had about a 5% survival. I think it's because it's, it was the, the variety. I mean, one was, a, one was a conventional that was raised, raised in Norway, I think, or Sweden. The other one was, was a GMO that had, had spring varieties crossed into it. Um, I think the varieties are getting better every year, we're seeing. But at, at the time, I mean, it was, it, it was a no-brainer. I mean, the, I, like I said, I had 100% survival on, on, the, on the conventional varieties, but the GMO just wiped me out. Uh, on that field, uh, uh, you know, canola is is, is pretty prone to, uh, to to pythium and other stuff. I mean, I think it's just disease. Um, that field right there, I slammed on the brakes, um, and D the field is Dean Drager's here in the background. Um, but they had actually bailed all that field off, took a match to it, and so it wasn't like it had a pile of residue to start with. I mean, that had already been bailed. Um, but that picture right there was a thousand words to me. Um, what's up? Oh, that's that's just taking the spring. So that's 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 this spring. So we'll, we'll I, we, we can come come back next year and have actually have beers. So I'll bring them next year, and we'll tell you how it did. Um, I mean, there's there's no really great way, but I will say the more precise you can be, the better. I mean, it's. It's not a shotgun effect. I've spent quite a bit of money on my drills and whatever else to do a better job. Um, Phil Thomas over there, I was just busy with him before I came in here. He said they even, he doesn't even bother talking seed, uh, pounds per acre anymore. It's, it's all seeds per, per square foot. And he was talking because there's such different variety sizes and everything. He was talking they can get 1,000 seeds in 2.5 grams and 1,000 seeds in 6.5 grams. So the seed size is very different. And they've also been able to come back and show that your larger seed size is more bigger, better pop up, everything like that. So um, I guess bottom line is the, the, the more accurate you can be, the better we are. Yeah, Tyler. Uh, I have, no, I, I just go straight seed in mine. Um, it's probably one reason why I'm saying zero your cups, and I've also went ahead and put the slow speed drives on. I mean, and speed is an amazing thing about it. Um, you would think, okay, I got this drill dialed in, and you, I got my little seed scale. The other thing I do when I'm seeding like four pounds to the acre is, is a seed scale will go, go 172 feet. I'll double, I'll quadruple that. Instead of doing 172, I'll go at uh, like five, 900 feet or something like that, whatever it works out to be. And so instead of catching four pounds, I'm catching 16 pounds in my cup. So to give me a better accurate. And also, you know, I'll do both drills. But what I've really also found is the speed sometimes. You're cruising along at four miles an hour and everything is great. Then you get impatient like I do all the time. And I'll bump the tractor up a couple of gears. And it literally seems to shake out of the boxes. And all of a sudden, your seeding rate's like seven pounds. And you're going, ah. You go back there and check it again. Of course, when you check it, you don't check it at seven pounds. You check it at four Or I mean, seven miles an hour. You check it at four miles an hour. Um, it's a small seed crop. Some guys do go ahead and blend it off. They'll put corn grit with it, or they'll mix some dry fertilizer with it. I would be careful with the nitrogen you put with it. Um, canola is very sensitive to starter fertilizer right next to it. And I guess that's one thing. I, I have put starter fertilizer with mine, but I have used a very low salt index fertilizer. I usually buffer it. I don't put a lot of nitrogen. My nitrogen goes down ahead of time, and, and also with my sulfur. Um, I'm pretty big on my sulfur count. We've seen anywhere from seven to one to three to one ratio in the last 20 years. 
I probably stick my ratio of like a five to one on the nitrogen sulfur river. But most of my fertilizer, if I put my SAR down, it's gonna be a little bit of boron, it's gonna be my FOSS package. And I do use a, a very low salt index starter fertilizer. I just don't go throw a bunch of 1034 on and go for it. I'm just, I'm, I'm leery about the separation. If I had more separation, I'd probably go for that. If, it, if it's pretty high. I mean, if, if your soil test high for, for I, I still will usually put just a something, a, a starter kicker just to get it off the right foot. Um, that's just me. I kind of like my fertility. I usually figure fertility is one of those things that I, I cannot wait. I can waste my money on a lot of things, but I usually figure my fertility program leaves my area. If I don't use it this year, I will use it next year. So I've never had a problem spending money on fertility. I always thought it was a great return on investment. Okay. <laughs> You better be the low ball price, man. <laughs> You're cheap, right? Yeah. Okay. I do as many as I can. <laughs> I mean, on the winter stuff I had that one year, I sprayed it out in the springtime, I mean in the fall, because it was getting pretty nasty. I didn't want the, the competition going against it. So I sprayed it out in the fall. Um, and then I would spray it in the, uh, in the spring, too, if I had the opportunity. Um, that one field I said I, was, I said it was a complete wreck, the one I, I said I wish I would have probably torn out. Um, that was conventional variety, and probably after that field, at least on my farm, I won't probably go back to a conventional variety just because I have so many problems. Um, oh, yeah, that's horrible. Now, like on my, my spring canola, I did spray it twice. Um, I don't know if I was supposed to, but I did. I mean, it's like, let's get, let's get on the program. A lot of times, and I, I will say that field was, the, the, my spring canola GMO field, it was so clean the next year. I mean, I had a, that field had Canadian issues. It had all sorts of problems. And the next year, you know, I think I just came in afterwards. I just disked it a couple of times, kind of broke up the stubble and went in and said it seeded wheat right into it. Um, I can show you some Google Earth pictures of that field. It's a lousy circle, but it yielded about 118, 119 bushels wheat on it um, the next year, which for that circle, there's, I got some crap ground up there. Um, so it's a tool. I use it like a tool. Um, and I've, you know, in the last few years, it's been a good money maker for me, too. Um, I can't almost say it's been a great money maker on the irrigation side just because I, I haven't done a very good job with it, but it's been a better tool on my dryland side. Um, it's compete, it's the, on the dryland side, it's outcompeted my irrigation or my dryland wheat every year so far. Um, especially when it's 30 cents, that's a no-brainer, so. Any other questions? I'll